Newport. My name is Ed Selich. I'm president of Speak Up Newport. Uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, the appetizers out there from the bungalow today. Uh, we really appreciate uh, them participating with uh, Speak Up Newport. Uh, our program this month is kind of on two subjects. One is on the water trash wheel that we're doing, and we're going to do a presentation on that first, and then we'll follow up with the presentation on the uh, on the new mooring plan that the city council is uh, starting. So first of all, the water wheel presentation is gonna be done by our public works director, Dave Webb. And I don't have his biography in front of me, but uh, I know he's an accomplished uh, civil engineer. He uh, used to work in the city of Huntington Beach and all the good stuff you see over there, he's responsible for. At least that's what he tells me. <laughs> and, uh, how many years you've been public works director here now? 2012, so nine years. So Dave does a great job for the city, so we really appreciate that. And then following Dave, uh, <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> what, what is this, a math lesson? <laughs> So um, our second presenter is Bill Kenny. Uh, Bill was a former Harbor Commissioner, and he's, uh, his uh, biography is way too detailed to read. So he's a commercial shopping center developer. He spent a lot of time at uh, Donahue Schreiber, developed a lot of projects here in Southern California, and uh, he started his company in, back in 1995. Um, he's done a lot of work uh, in his profession. Uh, he's past chairman and president and treasurer of the California Business Properties Association, uh, been involved in the International Council of Shopping Centers, um, and he's earned the coveted uh, CLS designation from the International Conference of Shopping Center. He's also served on the board of directors of the Riverside YMCA, the Balboa Yacht Club, Promontory Bay Community Association, as among a bunch of... Uh, other things that he's done here. Uh, he's lectured through Southern California to a lot of groups on real estate property practice. Um, he's a graduate with honors from Cal State University at Fullerton and uh, living in Promontory Bay. He's a resident of Newport Beach. So with that, we'll get started with, uh, with Dave. He'll do the water wheel presentation, and then Bill's going to come up and do the presentation on the mooring. And then after that, we'll take questions at the stand-up microphone. And with that, Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Ed. Well, thanks for joining us today, and I apologize for interrupting that exciting mooring discussion to come. I had a person go, hey, they changed the program. It's not moorings. They're coming. Bill's going to take care of that. But I want to spend a little time on what we call our water trash wheel. Uh, there's a picture on the screen here, and you're probably looking at it. It's a funky-looking thing. Um, the way this is uh, basically designed, it's a... Uh, the old-fashioned water is going to rake the, the trash that's going to be directed into it. It's going to take it up on a belt, and it's going to, in this case, be dropped into a dumpster behind it, and then we're going to haul that off. That's the simple principles of it. This facility is going to be located up in the San Diego Creek area, so I'll go through that and show it to you. But it's an exciting project. We're about to, uh, we've got our bids on this. We're now just trying to figure out our funding. So why are we doing this? Newport Beach multi-pronged trash approach. As you, if you live in the harbor or you're around here, you see a lot of trash. Um, we are at the lower end of San Diego Creek, the Del High Channel. So uh, I live in Mission Viejo. I don't contribute to your trash, but about three streets over from me in Lake Forest, the trash comes all the way up from there, all the way down San Diego Creek and ends up in the bay. Um, so we have a multitude of things that we're doing. We have catch basin inserts. You can see one here. I don't know if I have a pointer here. That one on the picture on the left is an insert inside the basin to try to help it. We have floating devices in the harbor that skimmers that pick up trash. We sweep our streets regularly, um, have all kinds of installation. Of, we have with the uh, CDS structures, big con uh, continuous deflection devices are called. If you ever see one of these, they're underground. They're really neat to watch, but our whole drainage system goes through it. S it sifts out the trash down to a cigarette butt and then discharges. Those are wonderful devices to try to keep the trash out, but we still have a lot of debris that we can't get. And the, and the frontier that's been a struggle is these big channels. We can get the little stuff, but when we have the rain flows, it's just too much to, to handle. 
So we've been looking at uh, some options. This right here is uh, the Delhi Channel. When you go up Irvine Avenue and you come to the golf course just before you go up to the airport area, you go over a channel there that dumps into the upper bay. If you look just north as you're going over that bridge, you'll see a boom out in the uh, channel. And this structure is actually tucked up in there. And what you're looking at here is what we did is um, you can see kind of the channel on the right there, and on the left side, I'm sorry, the right side, there's a screening device there. We cut out the side of the channel, we have a boom that goes across and diverts all the trash into this side chute over here on the left, you can see some trash built up in there. And that works in its way through a screening device and we're able to capture a lot of trash. This is the first large, really large uh, channel device that I've seen, I know there's probably a couple out there, but it's worked out good. Um, so we're trying to go to the next frontier and hit these big channels. Um, I'll just, I get my finger. If you can follow my finger. <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, so here's, here's an option to what we're trying to deal with with San Diego Creek. And you can see San Diego Creek, the big blue line there. But look at the drainage area there. It goes all the way to Orange, the foothills, right by Irvine Lake. The, it's a huge drainage area. All that area is mostly urbanized now. It used to be ranch lands and things like that. But that's the city of Irvine Lake, Forest, Tustin, Santa Ana, um, Orange in there. And that works its way down and comes into the upper bay, then the lower bay, then out into the ocean. So capturing that is kind of our goal. This is our, if you know where the Newport Aquatic Center is, we have deployed what they call a log boom. You can see a piece of it right there, and it floats out there. So we put this out every winter before the storms, and what it does, it captures what comes down that creek to some extent. And this is the floatables. There's a lot of organic matter you see in there, reeds and things like that, but there's also a lot of floatable trash. And then we drag all these up on the beach, load it up, and haul it off. I can't say we capture it all because you're still picking it up on your beaches, but this is our, our first attempt and our first line of defense. Um, again, and it's funny, I was just up with one of the council members walking this. There's some areas up in the upper bay where the stuff has worked its way back to the back. It's just a lot to clean up and hopefully we can reduce that. This is how we're taking care of it now. The Newport Bay Conservancy, other groups are up there on a continual basis. If you're going to volunteer, you can join one of those groups and go up and help pick out the trash out of the upper bay. Um, more pictures. So here's the upper bay up by the 73 freeway and Jamboree. Um, and our original thought, actually I'm gonna take your pointer, Bill. You've been so generous. Um, we originally were gonna uh, put this device in this area right here, if we can see it. Well, I, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. I think, yeah, what happens is pointers don't often work when you're on a screen. It, I found that early in my life, but uh, some do, some don't. But where it says Upper Newport Bay, we were thinking I'm putting the device in there. But the fishing game folks didn't like it. Some of our residents didn't either. They didn't want something out there in that pristine area, that big basin out there. And I, and I get it. But that was the original thought of how to operate. And so why that's important is because this device was going to be fed from the back. We are going to use skiffs and go up and grab the trash out of it and take it out. And there's some operating ones right now. They just built one in Los Angeles last year. I want to say Bi Biona Creek, but it might be. Is it? Yeah. You can look that up. It's really, it's really impressive. It's done a great job. They float it out in the middle of the creek and they put booms to either side and it's working to take out the trash. It's in a different situation, but it's, it's doing the same thing. But they put it out in an open area like that, what we would, and it would be easier to collect on the back. We didn't have the luxury, so we moved it upstream of Jamboree and it says project area there. That's where we're going to be building this device. It's a little more challenging. It's down in the creek. It's got steep walls, more environmentally sensitive. So we've been working on that. This is a little cutout, uh, Jamborees there on the left. We're looking at a cutout of how this is gonna sit in the channel. We have to actually build a pad because to have that device, you can see right in the middle of the creek there, the, the heavy thing right at the bottom there. And there's a rail system that's gonna take the trash containers over to the land. And then we have to build a loading pad for the trucks to come in and grab those things and take them out. Uh, a lot more invasive than if we were in the, in the, the um, uh, bay itself. So this is kind of what it started to look like, and this was modeled after Baltimore. This is actually a picture of, they call it the Mr. Trash Wheel. Um, works a little different, and you can look this up online. It's really kind of a great idea, but it sits in the Baltimore River there. But the difference with theirs and ours is their rivers are flowing all the time. Our rivers are stagnant unless we have basically rainstorms. So when you watch this, it's a continual wheel. As the, the booms go out to the banks, the trash is funneled, the floatable trash, I should say, is funneled to it. Again, it's collected in the front. There's a conveyor belt. 
and the water moving in the creek actually helps with the wheels on the side turn the conveyor belt and dump it in a in a bucket in the back and then a service barge comes up in the back grabs it puts a new um, uh, bin in there and takes the old one away and they have some solar panels on it so some electrical assist to make it work we're kind of modeling after this again but it's just going to flow differently we're going to have larger slugs in the west you know we get kind of downpours and big gully washers versus the east they get continual rain so we're, we're working with that it will probably operate a little different Again, floating container, I mentioned a little bit about this. Theirs was uh, floating, so the containers are at the back. We're going to have to build a rail system, which is the big difference between these two, and it also added a lot to the cost, i.e., we got our construction bids recently, and they're, they're high. Uh, we're, we're, we're basically about $2.7 million out of our budget zone right now. That's not all overage because we, we have two grants we got to help pay for this, but we need to raise some more money. So we're talking to council right now. Bill's going to talk to a little bit about the Harbor Foundation, a great foundation, is trying to raise some donations to help. We have some folks interested, a couple of commercial folks. We're hoping they might sponsor it. So um, we're looking to close that gap, and then we'd like to award this project at the council meeting on July 11th so that we can get started because we have to also work within the uh, migratory birds um, uh, schedule and we can't do any work uh, except for September to March that's when we're able to work in the channels so we got to get going on it unfortunately you're working in a flood control channel during the rain season it makes it a little challenging for me but that's that's our requirements so again the picture of the wheel it, it basically what you see here the trash is going to come in off the left it's going to be up a conveyor belt that little green system there is a basically uh, you can just call it a trash dumpster that's on a rail. It'll load that up. That cart is then going to be delivered and slid to the landslide where a, a forklift uh, loader can lift that cart up and dump it and then put it back in there. So you can see the rail system there in the back over to the land side. There'll be two cart capacity. And we'll, during rain season, we'll have to be constantly on that to pick that material up. I'm sure we'll get a lot of slugs of trash down there. This is the actual location with an artist's rendering over there. You can see Fletcher Jones in the background. Can you picture a, a Mercedes-Benz on the wheel there? I, I don't know. I'm, th I'm, th I'm thinking sponsors here, but, you know, uh, anyway, um, that's where it's going to be located. It's, I think we're kind of, I think we're going to try to color it that way so it's more camouflage, and then it'll grow in over time, but uh, you'll see it from Jamboree. Again, a little... That's the size of it. Remember, you're down in this channel. The channel, if you go over the bridge, you're 30 feet down there, 20 feet. So we have to work in that operation. And it's on piles that floats when the water rises, it rises up. And it's got to lift that trash up, put it on a rail. You can see the trash truck in the back. It's got to move that material over there. And this is that big difference between Baltimore, which what they do is they bring a barge right up to the back of it, pick it up, and take it out. And it's floating out in the water. We just don't have that luxury. so. We'll, we'll, uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, let me see, interceptor details. I'm sorry, we're engineers, we like to throw these plans in there for you, and they're confusing, but there's the detailed plans of it. We have a vegetation plan, the Coast Commission permits, the state fish and game permits, all that. We have to do uh, habitat, vegetation, and things like that to mitigate some of the impacts. This is our, our plans on that. And then we talk about the benefits again, the, just collecting this thing. I, I, I'm interested to see, I, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to store it. We have these booms, we'll have this big slug of stuff, and they'll be sitting out there like the, the, the log boom I showed. You know, it'll probably take days to just keep grinding this stuff up and pulling it out. I'm assuming that's how we're going to end up using this. It's, it's a brand new product for us. In fact, it's brand new other than the one in Baltimore and some others. So a little experimental too on our side. Um, here's our proposed schedule. Like I said, we're going to try to award this in the next uh, first part of July. We want to get started. We have to order parts, then we're going to get in the channel. We'll probably start construction somewhere in early fall, I'd say September or, or late September, October. Build it, install it over winter, and in the spring we'll get started up, basically. So we won't probably catch this rainy season. We'll be out there working, but for the following one we will. And again, I mentioned a little thing. The engineering design is done. The construction contract came at about $4 million. Um, We have about $1.9 in grants right now, so our funding gap is about $2.7 million, which we're working with the, the community and the council to solve that. Once we get that, we can get awarded and get under construction. So that's our water trash wheel. Yeah, the, the question is if it's electrical or solar driven. It, 
functions with a little water power as the water goes by, it pushes it, and then also needs some electrical assist. So that big canopy on top will have solar panels on it to charge some of it and help with the electric motors. So we're actually borrowing someone else's technology. This is actually working somewhere, and, and we're buying that technology, and then we're enhancing it. I don't think they have the rail system. We had to engineer. We got mechanical engineers on board to actually design that. So how about other questions? I don't want to take all the morning questions tonight. Sure, you please come up. What cities are contributing to all this trash, the, the cities above Newport? Is there any consideration of asking some of those cities to chip in? And just kind of philosophically, why, why can't people use trash cans? I mean, what, what is the problem? Is it lack of trash cans? So a couple of questions. So a couple of questions, and, and I would only answer that. that also a great, great work on your part. Thank you. We've actually asked our partners upstream. They're not, not saying no, but we haven't got contributions. They are, they're pitching in in their own independent ways. When we went through the recent changes with the water uh, State Water Control Board, they have a trash TMDL they put in place, which requires all the cities to start doing full capture. So they're busy catching up to us, putting catch basins in, screens, trying to catch the trash before it gets in the system. So we, I kind of talk to my staff, this is more of a belt and suspenders. It's probably going to be heavily used, hopefully, in the beginning. As years go by, maybe 10, 15 years, we're catching a lot less trash because our upstream partners are doing a lot more of it. And then it becomes kind of the suspenders that catch that last little remnant that comes down. Uh, I'm hoping that's how it works out because we really are trying to get that taken care of upstream. Uh, funding, hopefully they'll come along. We, when Newport's very good to be able to fund a lot of it. And again, 1.7 is our grants. We've had partners, OCTA and Ocean Protection Council, I think, that have been uh, bought into the idea and have helped fund it. So, Lauren? I'm sorry? Okay. I know Dan, but I'm sorry, Jan Irvine. Former daughter of the Irvine Ranch, I believe, as you mentioned, right? Wrong one? No, no I meant Jan Vandersloot. Oh, oh, okay. Jan would be all over this. But in any case, can you talk about um, the plants and what kind of plant restoration there will be and also what kind of outreach to the public because I can see on the one hand if people see it they go oh when I put trash in the bay we have to remove it but I can also see people going oh well that thing will just pick up my trash so how are we going to work on the human behavior side of it and that opportunity so the plant palette I can't speak other than you'll notice on the various items here restoration area, different uh, natural plants that are going in there. I noticed there's some ice plant pellet back in one area. But for the most part, that was what the uh, regional agencies want. So from a plant pellet standpoint, I, I don't know all the answers on that. I, I have the slide, basically. So there's various uh, 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 native plants and channel-driven plants in there. Um, so that, uh, what's your last question? I'm sorry. What's the public outreach plan? What's the Correct. So we, we do plan that, and it'll be a showpiece. We'll probably have uh, some um, YouTubes, probably, if I'm guessing our PR folks. will also do probably some standing websites. I'm also hearing, I haven't seen it, there'll be signage there. But there's really not a good place to stop, because Jamboree doesn't have parking, and you're flying by there. So it's probably going to be more PR, maybe from the bike trail side and the other side. We'll have to put some signage up there and explain what it is. Maybe it leads to field trips and others going to the bikes. Uh, path on the other side and be able to look at it, things like that. There will be a lot of PR. I know there's a lot of interest in talking about it. Once it gets operating, we'll start developing that. How about other questions? Yes, ma'am. Good to know. Thank you. Did you have another question you said that? Okay, thank you. Can I get any other questions or yes sir? 
Can you go to the microphone? No, I'm just saying that there's a lot of moving part in this system. So what is this expected maintenance cost and the long the life of this system? Because it, it seems to me like there there's a, a quite a bit of challenge in terms of uh, maintaining the system itself that's in working order. Yeah, there's belts and pulleys and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, I'm hearing anywhere from 10 to 20 years lifespan. It's brand new for us. Of course, we're going to coat the metals and things, but you are in a marine environment. It's a brackish environment up there, but you'll have some level of corrosion. We'll have a maintenance plan. It could be 50000 a year just to maintain it. You've got uh, greasing and changing of parts and stuff like anything, like a mechanical car. It probably starts off better as it gets older. We'll have more things breaking down. We'll have to put money into it. Uh, a lot of that is probably learn as we go, unfortunately, because it's a brand new kind of technology. <laughs> We're looking for volunteers. Come out and grease it up with me. Anybody else? All right, well, let's talk about moorings then. I think that's the hot topic tonight. So thank you for uh, letting me speak to you, and I'll turn over to Bill. Yeah, so we got lucky tonight. Oh. <laughs> Malfunction. Tighten that up. Is that going to stay? Um, I, I was going to tell you that I had a couple of disclosures for you. Uh, I'm just the substitute teacher tonight. The expert on the Open Water Initiative is Harbor. Commissioner Ira Beer, who unfortunately is in a Harbor Commission meeting next door. And I was going to tell you that uh, our public works director was the expert with respect to the water wheel project. And we got lucky and we had him here this evening, so he has all the right questions. I will touch on one thing. The Newport Harbor Foundation, which was created to um, restore and enhance Newport Harbor, is actively seeking contributions and donations to fund the gap in the water wheel. And for any of you who would like to write checks this evening, um, we'd be happy to take them. Uh, the city has told us that we do have naming rights available for the right contribution, so keep that in mind. Um, with that, let's, uh, if there's no more questions for Dave, Dave thank you very much. Uh, it was great taking me off the hook on that one. Um, like to recognize a couple of our council members. I see the Honorable Robin Grant back there. Um, and I saw the Honorable Joe Stapleton earlier. Did he depart? I think he did. But thanks for joining us. Um, let's talk a little bit about the what's known as the Open Water Initiative. Um, now, I have to say that there are those that are in favor of the Open Water Initiative, and there are some that are opposed. And we'll do our best to present this in a non-denominational manner tonight. Um, let's start with a little history about the moorings. Um, in fact, let's go back further. The State Lands Commission granted sovereign title to the tied and submerged, submerged lands in trust to the city of Newport Beach in July of 1919. You can get it up in the corner there. There you go. Um, that's fine. What will we do without the technological experts? Yeah, I can use this too, can I? No, no, I'll have to use this. Yeah, okay. There we go. Now, um, I, I, the background, I think, is important. Um, uh, generally, the granting bill states that the lands shall be used by the city for purposes in which there is general statewide interest as follows, and I'm going to read this for you. Uh, number one, for the establishment, improvement, and conduct of a public harbor for the promotion and accommodation of commercial and navigation. Number two, for the establishment, improvement, and conduct of public bathing beaches, public marinas, public aquatic playgrounds, and similar recreational facilities open to the general public. 
and number three, for the preservation, maintenance, and enhancement of the land in its natural state and the reestablishment of the natural state of the lands so they may serve as ecological units for scientific study as open space and as environments which provide food and habitat for birds and marine life and which favorably affect the scenery and climate of the area. And I apologize for the long-winded reading, but I think that's important. That's the mandate that the city has with respect to the harbor. That means Newport Beach is ob obligated to operate Newport Harbor for these purposes. State uh, Statute 74, which was enacted in 1978, and which is more commonly known as the Beacon Bay Bill, succeeded and updated this legislation, and so what we have today is fairly current. Now, with respect to the moorings in Newport Harbor, the best information that I was able to obtain is that they've been in existence at least since the 1950s. Now, while the city has had the obligation of preserving and maintaining and enhancing the state lands, which is Newport Harbor, the administration of the moorings was handled by the county sheriff's Harbor Patrol Department since at least the 1970s. And during that period, which the Harbor Patrol managed the mooring, there were really no policies or procedures dealing with mooring permit transfers, mooring length extensions, or any other changes in the mooring fields. As a result, the mooring fields became pretty much a haphazard collection of vessels within the prescribed mooring areas themselves. And while there had been talk at City Hall for many years about taking over the management, the City Council finally acted in 2017 to terminate the mooring management contract with the County Harbor Patrol and take over the management of the moorings. And at that time, the City also created the Harbor Department, which was a new department for the City of Newport Beach. And one of the responsibilities of the Harbor Department was and is now to manage the moorings in Newport Harbor. So that's a brief background of the history of the moorings leading up to where we are today. Uh, we all know that our harbor is not going to get any bigger. However, the number of users and types of uses are steadily increasing. For those of you that are on the harbor, you know that there are all kinds of new devices out there. There are more and more people that are using the harbor, whether it's in human-powered craft or rental craft or their own vessels. According to a Newport Harbor stakeholder study that was prepared by the Harbor Commission, Newport Harbor plays host to over 7.1 million visitors annually. Now the intent, according to the Harbor Commission, of the, new, of the Open Water Initiative is just that. It's an attempt to concurrently make more open space in the waters of Newport Harbor by reducing the footprint of the mooring fields and increase the safety of navigation within those mooring fields and throughout the harbor. Uh, let's take a look at the presentation that was actually made by the Harbor Commission to the City Council in May um, about this proposed reconfiguration. The Harbor Commission annually prepares a list of objectives and that is the pursuit of the Commission for the year. That, those objectives are submitted to the City Council for review and approval. The, um, one of the objectives of the Harbor Commission was to evaluate the current mooring fields and provide a recommendation for new guidelines that better define roads and fairways to improve navigation and safety and improve optimization of space within the mooring fields. These are all required by the Beacon Bay Bill. And as I mentioned, for decades, there have been no guidelines for mooring length extensions, uh, transfers, issues like spreader lines in fairways that uh, cause the potential for um, accidents or somebody that's gonna come through and get a uh, propeller tied up in a mooring line. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, you'll notice that today the, the uh, fairways are dangerously narrow. They're cluttered. Um, Propellers often get entangled with spreader lines and mooring lines. 
Um, the uh, photo on the right, um, again, closer view. Uh, some of the fairways are very narrow. Uh, there's one picture of a spreader line that's well out into the uh, well out into the fairway. Uh, current spacing between the boats is also an issue. Uh, many of the boats are close together. Uh, the photo on the left shows a fairway less than 20 feet wide. Uh, the medium, medium or the middle photo shows you that there's very difficult access for the public through the uh, the uh, moorings fields. And then on the right, again, boats that are very close together. Those boats will probably have a problem in a weather event. Um, the solution, according to the Harbor uh, Commission, for, uh, for improved navigation safety and creating new open water space is to go to a double row configuration as opposed to the current sig single row mooring configuration. Uh, the results, again, according to the Harbor Patrol, our, our Harbor Commission, are improved public access, increased size of navigation channels, wider and more well-defined fairways, increased spacing, more overall room when navigating or departing through the mooring field, um, safer navigation through the mooring fields, both for the permittees and for other uses of, users of the harbor, and the possibility to add additional moorings within the mooring fields. Now this is a photo of the current mooring fields H and J. And for those of you that are not really familiar with the harbor, this is the area bounded on the west by Lido Peninsula, on the south by Lido Island, uh, and on, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on the north by South Lido Island, and then on the south by Marina Park and uh, the American Legion. And without policies defining row and fairway sizes, Mooring fields can become a safety concern to navigate and become very inefficient of the use of the limited waterways that we have. This is a photo of a mooring field in San Diego Harbor known as America's Cup Harbor. And what's interesting is that if we go back to the mooring fields H and J, they currently take up 30 acres of water space and we moor 200 boats. When we go to America's Cup Harbor, there are approximately 180 boats in that mooring field. That mooring field takes up only 15 acres. This is a mooring field with double rows that provide more efficient use of limited space. Standardized boats per uh, fairway uh, length. Uh, wider fairways, this has been in operation for 40 years. According to the city's uh, engineers, similar wind and current conditions exist both in America's Cup Harbor and in Newport Harbor. And um, so the, the benefit here is that we gain a lot more of the open space waterways. This slide is a summary of the specifications for the double row moorings as proposed by the Harbor Commission. I, I needn't go through all of the uh, of the details, but this is what's being proposed by the, uh, by the Harbor Commission. This is a photo, um, if you look at the left, you see current conditions. You see boats of varying sizes. You see a fairway that's difficult to see through and difficult to navigate through. When you look at the right side of the slide, you see a double row configuration with boats of equal size in each row and a nice wide fairway which also provides a significant view corridor for those either who are on the bay or who live uh, on the beach, uh, on Balboa Island, wherever you might be. In addition, what's being proposed is some new technology for the tackle, which should significantly mitigate damage to the eelgrass. And for those of you who are not familiar with eelgrass, the city has a mandate to maintain a certain acreage of eelgrass throughout the harbor. And it's a very big problem because if you have a dock and there's eelgrass underneath, you, uh, have, you could have an issue of trying to even maintain or, or, or repair your dock. Uh, and so we have to be very cognizant of how much eelgrass is in the harbor. Again, according to the city's engineers, this new technology will mitigate the amount of damage that the, um, 
mooring tackle causes to the eelgrass. This slide shows the concentrations of eelgrass in mooring fields A and B, which are along the south side of Balboa Island and along the north side of the easterly end of the Balboa Peninsula. Now, what is being proposed is merely a test of the double row mooring concept in mooring field C. And mooring field C is located immediately east of Bay Island, immediately north of the Balboa Peninsula, and almost up to where the Balboa Ferry landing is on the peninsula. This slide shows the randomness of the existing mooring spacing in the sea field. And you can see boats that are outside of the uh, fairways, outside of the actual mooring field, uh, and it's just a poor utilization of space. By implementing the double row configuration, the overall footprint of mooring field C is reduced by two acres, significantly opening up the waters of Newport Harbor. As important, the navigation channel between the mooring field and the docks along Balboa Peninsula is significantly widened. Now this is an aerial of mooring field B, and mooring field B is along the south side of Balboa Island. Notice how narrow the channel is between the docks and the mooring field. This is an area actively used by beachgoers, kids with flotation devices, swimmers, paddleboarders, rental boats, and larger boats transitioning through the area. And again, remember the mandate of the Beacon Bay Bill. When we look at a double row mooring field, notice how the configuration of this field opens up the channel. We have a much wider channel and a safer channel between Balboa Island and the mooring fields. We have larger fairways creating view corridors so that if you're on the beach, you can look through the moorings instead of looking at a hodgepodge of boats. Uh, improved open water, and we have the ability to add eight new moorings, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now this slide goes back to the mooring fields H and J, which are off of Lido Peninsula. Um, as you can see on the left, we have a poor utilization of space. We're taking up 30 acres of water. Um, fairways uh, average less than 40 feet, and the fairway is how you get through the mooring field and to your mooring if you're a mooring permittee. And these fields are not compliant with the current harbor design standards. With the double row mooring system, we have improved navigation and utilization of space. We have fairways that are 60 to 90 feet wide. We have larger navigation channels, again, between Lido Island and the H and J mooring fields. And we bring the mooring fields in compliance with the harbor design standards. Now, in addition to the reconfigurations being proposed, the Harbor Commission did propose changes to Title 17. Title 17 is that portion of the city's municipal code that deals with the harbor. The substantive changes being proposed by the Harbor Commission are the implementation, finally, of policies to deal with requests to extend the length of a permittee's mooring, to provide the harbor master with the ability to take action when a vessel drifts out of its assigned area and creates a navigational hazard, to allow a mooring permittee to convert to a single line mooring with a sand line, which is similar to what we all use in Catalina Island, and to create new moorings that will be administered on a lottery system by the city, which means that a mooring permittee won't actually have to buy a permit. Now, the goal for the moorings is to provide reasonable cost vessel storage. For those of you that are not aware, if you'd like to have a permit today, it's going to cost you somewhere in the neighborhood $1,200 per lineal foot, and maybe more. That means if you would like a mooring, you have to go buy one. If you have a 50-foot boat, 
it's going to cost you $50,000 just for the right to have a mooring in Newport Harbor. What's being proposed for these new moorings is for those to be administered by the city on a lottery system. So the permittee won't have to spend $50,000 to get reasonably cost access to boat storage in Newport Harbor. Now, the question has been asked, has there been any public outreach? Has this been vetted? There were over 11 public hearings and very many stakeholder meetings where public input was obtained uh, on this project. Now, this is a quick summary of the process and the benefits. And again, I, I'm not going to go through these in detail. But there was hundreds and hundreds of letters and emails received. Um, there was, um, again, uh, many, many public hearings. Uh, clean up the mooring fields with no cost to the existing permittees is what's being proposed. Um, the mooring permittees will remain in the same mooring field and to the extent possible be in a like-for-like -like situation. Uh, there's accommodation for a number of requests for extension that mooring permittees have asked for that have been on hold as this has gone through the process. Wider fairways, uh, fewer expected incidents, certainly improved aesthetics as you are able to look through the mooring fields. The cost for this test is completely picked up by the city. Um, and the cost estimate today is about $410,000 to do the tests on mooring field C. With that, I think as you can see, in the opinion of the Harbor Commission and certainly Commissioner Beer, um, this proposal benefits all of the stakeholders and mariners, including the 9,000 boats that are in the harbor today, opens up the waterways, creates more open space, makes the mooring fields safer and much more attractive. And so that was the proposal that was given by the Harbor Commission to the City Council. The City Council approved that on May 23rd at a 7-0 vote. So with that, I'll attempt to answer questions, but again, I'm only the, uh, um, uh, uh, the substitute teacher tonight, the experts next door. If I can't answer your questions, I'd be happy to take your contact information, get you an answer, and get back to you. Yes, sir? Are you increasing the number of slots or mooring uh, uh, opportunities for boaters? Yeah, again, the intent is to add additional moorings in each of the mooring fields, but those moorings would be administered solely on a lottery basis. So today, if you want a mooring in Newport Harbor, you're going to have to purchase one. The new moorings will be administered on a lottery basis. So you. So if I can give you an example, I have a mooring in Catalina. I was on a list for 14 years. I finally got the call, Mr. Kenny, you have a choice of B4 or B10 in Henrock, which would you like? And I said, can I do a little homework and, and get back to you? She says, get back to me by 5 o'clock or you go to the bottom of the list. That's the way it's done in, in Catalina. And so the new moorings would be administered on a lottery basis. If you don't want your mooring anymore, you give it back to the city and it goes to the next person on the list. Well, why is this $10 market? They're typically done on the open market today. Um, we're, the city is aware of transfers, obviously. The city requires to know what the purchase price is. But basically, um, you know, you find them on Craigslist, you find them on the open market. Yes, sir. I live on Bay Island and uh, facing the West. And first of all, let me say that uh, your presentation is excellent. It makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I have a question which likely was answered previously, and I apologize in advance. So I live on Bay Island, and um, 
Uh, I understand that the, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm faint. I, I have a uh, low blood pressure. May I come back at a- Absolutely, Walkie. I'm Take sorry time. for it. No, it, let, let's get a microphone to him when, while he's sitting down. Yeah. I don't like to see that, Walkie. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I guess I have several questions and some points. First of all, in the B section that you showed, I'm currently the fourth boat in. According to that, I will now be way down at Marine Avenue because I have a 40 foot mooring. You have the extra additional moorings that they're going to lotto off also at the very end. Say somebody has a 65 foot boat that they want to lotto a mooring for, where'd they go? If all the back ones that are the, the ones that are new are only 40 feet, where does that, how does that help that person who, who wants a bigger mooring? Or are the new moorings that are 65, 60, 65, are they gonna be open until they're lottoed off? Yeah. I, I'm confused about who gets the lottos based because they're at the back of your mooring field. They're only gonna be 40 feet long. Right, let's take those a step at a time. Okay. It's my understanding that all of the existing permittees are accommodated first. Um, it's my understanding that the Harbor Department is gonna do their very best to keep people in a like position. The goal here is to try to get the rows with the same size boats so that we can open up the fairways. Correct. All right, and, and I have to agree, I think that and as a long time boater in the Harbor, I think that makes boating through and into and out of the mooring fields safer. Now, I'm sure there are gonna be a few situations where people are not gonna be able to get like for like. My understanding is that there really is no set length yet for the proposed additional moorings, and those would only be dealt with after the existing fields are reconfigured and all of the existing permittees are taken care of. So for instance, if you, are you 65 feet? No, I'm only 40. You're 40? you would go in a 40 foot row. Correct. Um, and you know, you would be as close to where you are now as is, is at all possible. Uh, wouldn't even deal with the new moorings that are being proposed until all the existing permittees are taken care of. Right. Okay, but my question is, given the graph that you have, all of the new moorings for the city are at the end of the field. So those are 40 feet long. Well, they may be 40 feet, they may be 60 feet. I don't think we're really know yet. This is just conceptual. Not all of the mooring fields, to my knowledge, have been completely mapped out, and they can't be until all of the existing permittees have been dealt with. Okay. So I fully expect that as we go through this process, that the fields will be tweaked. And so it may be that the way the, con the conceptual drawing shows it's 45 feet, and 50 feet and 60 feet. And in reality, it might be a 50 foot and a 45 and then a 60 feet. So I think, I think you gotta work through this and uh, take it literally a step at a time. Okay. And remember, and all this is is a test, all right? It's a test of the C field to see if the double row system and the new tackle really works. And if it does, then the city moves forward. Okay, and I'm sorry, my last question is somebody brought up at another meeting that they have been on the waiting list for probably 20 years to get a mooring. They don't have $100,000 to bid on a lotto for one of these moorings. What do we tell them? That's exactly why the city is trying to create the new moorings, because they then will be able to go on that list, just like I did, and hopefully get a mooring without having to pay Twenty or fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Oh, it was given to us that there will be a lotto that the people have to spend money to to get a permit for that. No, ma'am. So it'll be an open lotto. No, no it's, it's it's a no cost lotto. No cost. What Absolutely, it's not a, it, it's not a lottery. It's it's a list. Again, it's it's just the way it works in Newport Harbor or in in Catalina. You apply. You ask to be put on the list. Now I have to admit. The uh, Conservancy charges $10 a year 
to have your name remain on the list. Right. So there is a slight fee, and I don't know that the city of Newport would charge that. But it, yeah, it's not a lottery where you have to pay anything. These moorings would be free to acquire, and then they would pay their annual mooring permit fee just like you do. Oh, okay. Then, because I think one time when it was given to us, it was an open lotto system, and that money that they collected for those was going to help offset the cost of the new mooring. Well, the city was again, paying. that's if if we create 20 new moorings and each of those permittees pays an annual permit fee, that's new revenue to the city. That money is used then to offset the cost of the relocation. And remember, all that money goes into the Tidelands Fund. It has to be used in the Bay. Thank you. So it's for all of our benefit. Good evening, Mr. George Hilkema. Hilkema. Uh, I see you used again uh, the America's Cup Harbor in San Diego. The singular concern of the Newport Mooring Association is the difference there is that there's virtually zero current there. And we have a river in Newport Beach, particularly in the sea mooring field, four times a day in and out with the tide. And we measured those currents and calculated times and so on. But uh, you talk about it, you talk about a test plan and you made no description of what you're going to test. The singular thing that concerns us is that with paired boats, you're always in danger of hitting your boat, departing or leaving, depending upon wind and tide. Nothing has been said by Mr. Beer or the plan as to does the test plan address that? And if you do test, how many collisions out of 100 attempts will you allow before you approve the plan? Uh, in answer to your first question, I certainly am not an expert in tides and winds. The city has relied on noble engineering uh, to, uh, that, I'm sorry, sir, I'm just going to tell you what I know. All right. The city of Newport Beach has retained an engineering firm who is of the opinion that the tides and the winds are similar. Um, I'm not going to debate that with you. I'm not the expert in that regard. I would rely on the civil engineer to tell me what really works and what doesn't. As far as how many times we're going to have incidents, that's the whole purpose for the test. I can't answer your question as to whether or not the test would stop at one incident or two or 10 or 20. In, any um, at all would, would be too much because there's no record of accidents at the present time. Well, that's, again, uh, not to my knowledge whether or not there are or they're not. Um, and, and I'm, again, I'm the substitute teacher tonight. I'm just telling you what the Harbor Commission I found. And I've, I've heard all the arguments. Um, I've heard them many, many times. I heard them when I was on the Harbor Commission. So um, you needn't repeat them. I know what they are. Well, the engineering consultation that was availed provided no coastal engineering input of the operational aspects of this. All they did was calculate loads on the screw and anchor. That's it. I wasn't at any of those hearings, so I can't respond to that. All right. Am I up? <laughs> All right, walkie. Yes, sir. Yeah, I apologize. No, don't, I don't apologize. So to, to, the, to the north of, where, of the mooring fields off our west is, is a designated anchorage, as I'm sure you're aware. My understanding is that this is also to be a repository for contaminated soils from the Rhine Channel, albeit with a cap. My question, it may, this may not be in your bailiwick, but as, as people anchor, are there anchors likely to penetrate the cap and uh, allow contaminated soils to be dispersed into the water? Yeah, I'll touch on that very briefly. Uh, entirely different subject. What you're talking about is the dredging. There are contaminants in the harbor today. They're there. The harbor needs to be dredged. It's well above its design depth. And every time a larger boat goes by, the contaminants that are laying on the bottom are kicked up into the water table. All right? And that exposes anybody that's in the water to the contaminants. The city had two options. They needed to remove the contaminants in order to get all of the permits necessary to do the dredging. 
And one option is to take those contaminants out of the harbor, truck them to a land site, dry them out, and then ship them to a disposal site somewhere in New Mexico or Utah. The cost to that was absolutely prohibitive, and I wish Dave Webb was here. I want to say it was somewhere in the $20 million range. At that point, the city says, no deal, we can't do anything. The option that's been used successfully throughout other harbors in California was to do what's called a confined aquatic disposal site. The experts state that the cap that's on there is not going to be disturbed by anchors or boat traffic or tidal flow or anything else. But if in fact there is the potential for that cap to be disturbed, the city has an obligation to monitor that cap. So the city's going to know if for any reason that cap starts to deteriorate. And so would you rather have those contaminants underground where they're not in your water table or would you rather have them stirred up every time we have a lower tide? I know where I'd be on this one. You know what? We always like private donations to fund some of these costs. If, for, for 20 million bucks, we can get it out of there. Don't quote me on that number. I don't know it's exactly 20, but it's, it's, it's huge. If Dave Webb would know. I'm not the expert at that one. But, but there's the answer to your question. It's going to be monitored. So, um, you know, the experts believe it's safe. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, the list for um, the reasons behind the whole initiative is very extensive. Um, meeting harbor design standards, the protection of the environment, giving the vast public access to fields uh, by way of waterways, and making it uh, a lot more aesthetically appealing for some who are concerned about the aesthetics of boats on the water. And, uh, and also navigable space in the harbor and footprints of these fields. The question that are on the tongues of many, many people is uh, why uh, there's a, there seem to be a double standard <clears throat> in the city of Newport Beach as in its approach to the harbor. For example, uh, the, we have uh, mooring fields like we've just seen now. If we move the slide a little bit down on a Google search, we would come to places like the uh, Newport Harbor Yacht Club, which is also right next to Bay Island. And an aerial view of that Yacht Club shows that the boats are completely scattered. There's no public uh, fairway through them. There's no concern for the public in that area or in the other Yacht Club areas. Uh, the eelgrass seems to be of more importance under the other fields, but not there. And uh, the footprint of the Newport Harbor Yacht Club in particular is about twice the amount of footprint that we see on the sea field just on the other side of Bay Island. And the same number of boats occupy both those fields. So the question is, uh, does Newport Harbor have any, uh, does the city of Newport Beach, or why is it that um, we don't seem to include the whole of the harbor, but only selectively looking at the mooring fields and not include the, the yacht clubs, the many, many yacht clubs that are very large and very special to our community, but that's a, an equal standard that seems to be up here. I'm, I was wondering if you have an uh, answer to that. You know, that's the first time that's been raised. I have no answer for you. Um, the Yacht Club, there are three Yacht Club fields, Newport Harbor, Balboa, and uh, Lido Island. Uh, and the Newport Harbor and Balboa Yacht Club fields are larger fields. Those are all single point moorings. They're not double point moorings. And that, what that means, for those of you that are not familiar with moorings, that means that the boats actually swing 360 degrees. And so it's an entirely different type of mooring system. It's something that was provided for many, many years ago in the city's municipal code. Uh, but I don't have an answer for you. Uh, that, and it's interesting, that was never raised, it certainly wasn't raised when I was on the Harbor Commission. Uh, but, but by statute, Newport Harbor Yacht Club, Balboa Yacht Club, and Lido Island Yacht Club 
have their own mooring fields and they administer their own mooring fields. So it's not the city's responsibility. They have to pay the fees, of course, the same fees that you pay, but they administer their own fields. Uh, what the city is also doing, which I think is going to be very beneficial, is they're allowing the yacht clubs to test what we call multiple vessel mooring systems. And this is more for the sailing boats. And so instead of putting one boat on a mooring, they are putting a float, a portion of a dock on, on a mooring, and tying two or four boats. So for example, Harbor 20s, we have a very large Harbor 20 fleet in the harbor. You actually can put four Harbor 20s on a single point mooring that would otherwise take a 40 foot boat. And so again, it's just optimization of the use of the tidelands. But th that's something that should have been raised, I think, you know, earlier on. It's, it's a good point and I don't know the answer. Anything else? When do you anticipate this test to start? You know, sir, I don't know the answer to that, but I believe fairly soon. I think that, um, now that the city council has approved the test, that it's up to the harbor department to start putting it in place. Any idea how long it would take to complete? No, sir, I don't know the answer to that. But if you want to give me your contact information, I'll be happy to get those answers for you. Anything else? Yes, sir. It, it seems to me that you talk a nice talk, a nice presentation. I can see how everything would be much flowing and much better if everything was aligned as it was in San Diego. We'd love to have that. I think everyone would love to have that. But if you take moorings and you stick them together, nose by nose, tail by tail, however you want to do it, you're taking moorings, or let's call it, let's move it to a, a house, okay? So let's just take those houses, instead of having the ability to navigate in between those houses, let's just say by a walkway like they do in Venice or something else, and we take away that walkway and we put it together because then the other walkways would be bigger on each side. But now that house has lost its front yard or its backyard. And so instead of making it more naviga naviga navigationable for harbors and the, and the boats that use the harbor, you're now gonna push them together and then you're gonna put more boats in. So it's gonna create not more navigation, it's gonna be the same navigation problem and it really comes down to the one issue which is how to line up the cans for all these moorings. So if you've got somebody that lines up the cans the way they should be lined up, and you put the boat distances and the boat lengths in the same rows, then that's maybe a better issue or a better solution for navigability to navigate through the moorings, is what I'm trying to say. And that's what you've said that this whole presentation is about is to be able to give more navigation towards the community. So I call bullshit on the whole thing, to be honest with you. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with you in that regard, and that may have been something that should have been raised, you know, months and maybe years ago. Um, and remember, this is a test. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And we go back to plan A. So, any further questions? With that, I'll turn it over to our president. Okay, thank you, Bill. That was a good presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. Good job. Okay, so uh, next month our program is going to be the uh, new police chief. So uh, you might want to join us for that and uh, learn about how he plans on running our police department and all things crime related uh, in Newport Beach. So we'll see you all next month. Good evening.